know. But so, um, let's go ahead and get started. So the topics okay. that we're going to be going over this webinar today. Um, first, we're going to have an introduction of Tommy Griffiths is going to tell you all a little bit about himself, about his career. Um, then he's going to let you guys know how does he use Voice Bunny, basically how what he does from the first time that he opens and that he gets an email of a booking to the moment that he submits the recording. Then we're going to get to the fun part, to the best part, what we're all looking for here is how does he get that take that is going to make sure that that Waze Bunny project is approved by QC and by the client. Just make sure that that Waze Bunny booking is perfect and that it works just exactly as it should. So. Um, he's going to go over some steps that he does before recording, while recording, and after recording so that all of us can learn and all of us can know a little bit more about how he uses and how he works when he does in voiceover. Um, at the end of the session, as is usual with his um, webinars, we're going to have a Q&A section. Um, in your panels and your Zoom page, you're going to see a Q&A button. Um, please go ahead and click that and you're going to be able to submit all of your questions and at the end we're going to go ahead and cover them all. You can either add them while he's speaking or when we're done with the whole presentation. We will be moderating the questions and making sure that um, most of the questions are answered. So let's get started. Okay. So Tommy, I give you the microphone. Well, thank you uh, very much. Angela and, and Duan, I, I do appreciate it. Um, I really, and I don't say this because I'm uh, sort of a, a, a guest here with Voice Bunny, but, but I mean it. Um, Voice Bunny, I think, is probably, if not the best, definitely the most underrated online tool that a, a voice actor can use. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. As, as we go on. But I started my, uh, my voice career very, very young when I was 16, 17 years old, long time ago. I come from my broadcasting background. My father was in radio. I remember at the age of three, sitting on, on his lap when he was doing his radio show. And, and just so I could think to myself, I was on the radio. I would cough out loud just because I thought it was such a cool thing. To, to get my voice, not, not just my voice, but a cough on the air. And, and, and since then, I've just always been wrapped up in, in broadcasting and voiceover in one aspect or another. Uh, you know, other than the uh, couple of fast food restaurants that I worked at, you know, early on in my early, early teens, I would say that uh, at, at, since the age of 17, uh, the only paycheck that I've ever received was a, a paycheck that I, I received because Someone paid me to use my voice. And, and I was taught very early on the right way and the wrong way to, uh, to do voiceover. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, th there's no, let me just start by saying, there's no one right way to do voiceover. There are millions of wrong ways to do it, but there's no one right way. So keep that in mind as, as we speak. Uh, I started working early on in California for a, a big uh, producer who, who, you know, I just lucked in, in, into uh, being an intern for early on and, and started in radio. And, and as I was doing radio, I would, uh, you know, morning radio where, uh, you know, here in the US, we uh, played very little music and, and it was more about writing scripts and bits and, and voicing things, casting and voicing and all that and, and, and having fun. And, and that's where I really sort of dug my claws in deeply into doing the voiceover thing. Uh, then, uh, probably 10 years ago or so, I decided that I don't want to work for anybody uh, but myself and decided that I was going to do voiceover full time. Uh, it, it seems like a logical step for someone in broadcasting to go from you know, being on the radio into voiceover. Uh, it, it seems like the, the logical thing to dovetail into. Uh, but it's a lot harder than you would think. Uh, speaking on the radio, talking on the air, whether it's radio or television, is a lot different than doing voiceover, mainly because when you're on the air, as a broadcaster, most of the time you are speaking from your own words. You are 
communicating your own ideas. In voiceover, you are speaking someone else's ideas. You are, are, are trying to relay someone else's ideas, their script, uh, to make it sound like those ideas originate with you, uh, as if they're coming from you uh, with real passion. And, and, and not just passion, but, but with real emotion and, and with an organic feel so that these are your own words. So along the way, these are the things that I've learned that I would like to share with you. Um, you, the, uh, the member of Voice Bunny, or those who, who are thinking about uh, joining Voice Bunny. So th that's a little bit about my background, uh, Angela and Juan. Uh, and yeah, I mean, if anyone else has any other questions later on, I'm sure we can answer those, but I won't bore you with the rest of the story. Awesome. Thank you. So let's get to the next part. So Tommy, how do you use Voice Bunny? What is your thought process? What do you do? So if you want, I can um, allow you to share your screen if you want. Sure. Um, so let me bring my uh, Voice Bunny profile up. And for some reason, I'm having trouble with this. Um, in sharing the screen, I've got like half the screens blacked out and I don't know why. Um, I was hoping that I could do this, but uh, let's let's try it this way. Uh, that's so weird, why it's doing that. Um, if you're having troubles there, you can um, send me the link uh, like of the project that you'd like to share. Yeah. Um, oh, it's I, I think it's there. Oh, is it showing? Yeah, I believe it is. Okay. Um, for whatever reason, I, I'm having trouble with this. Um, let me just explain it what, rather than wasting time clicking around here. Um, I choose, the one thing, the one great thing about Voice Bunny is that you can choose how you wanted, how you would like to work. Um, the, the, the great thing about Voice Bunny is that you can choose re whether you want to just do bookings or as you call them, speedies. And what are the other ones? Speedies and quickies? <laughs> and the contest. So we have the contest, speedies, and bookings. <laughs> I, I didn't think they were called quickies. Um, can, you oh, yeah, my, quickies uh, can, can you see name. my projects page here at all? See, it's not, for whatever reason, it's not sharing properly. Yeah, I see. It, it doesn't show right. Yeah, it, it is showing yeah. like um, half of it. Yeah, it's kind of frozen up. Let me just explain it then. Okay, I'm going to share the, the slides anyway then. Yep, just share the slides. So um, the great thing about Voice Bunny is that you're allowed to configure the way you want to do work, uh, the way you want to do work uh, from whether you, you want to audition for jobs, um, which are the, the, the speedies in the contests, or whether you'd rather rely on your demos to get you work. And those are mere bookings. And that's how I decided that, that I wanted to, to get my work um, through Voice Bunny, by just doing bookings. And uh, with, with the way that I've sort of uh, assumed uh, the process as far as Voice Bunny, let, let me tell you this, this is no exaggeration, and I'm not just saying this because Angela and Juan are, are here and I'm doing a Voice Bunny thing. Um, other than my own private client list, I make more money doing Voice Bunny work than any other platform that's online. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. There are other platforms out there. And we all know that. It's, it's, it's no secret. But Voice Bunny and, and the way that they've allowed voice talent to approach getting work uh, has made it possible for me to, to make more money on the Voice Bunny platform than any other platform. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard things about how, how Voice Bunny doesn't, um, you, know, you, you don't get jobs that pay well. That's not true at all. Some of the highest jobs that, that I've ever been, been paid for, or the highest pay that I've, I've received from jobs comes from Voice Bunny. And that's because you can set your own rates. You can set your own fees and, and you can choose the way you want to get work, whether it's you know, from speedies or contests or bookings. So I choose bookings and I've set my own rates to do that. And, and let me just tell you this, uh, when you first start out with voice, voice Bunny, it's a good idea to set your rates relatively low. Get into the game. 
assimilate into the mainstream of the process before you start to um, raise your rates. And as you get a job, you can raise your rates slowly and incrementally. W would you agree with that, guys, Angela and, and Juan, that that's the best way to, uh, to approach your rates? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that that's something that we also always mention whenever um, our users are starting with Voice Bunny. So I think that that's something that is pretty accurate. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch as, as to, to why um, I feel I've been successful with Voice Bunny is because I've, I've taken advantage of the opportunities that they allow with uh, the fact that I just want to do bookings and I set my own rates. So the question is, how, how do I use uh, Voice Bunny? Well, I post, you know, the demos. And, and Voice Bunny's demo system is a little bit different than any, everyone else's. Uh, there's smaller samples of your work, but more specific, whether it's a movie trailer or it's a radio or TV tag or documentary narration or, or whatever it is. And based on those, you can get your booking. So when uh, I get an email that says, it's time to, time to get to work, like I did today, I got a, uh, uh, a job that I just finished um, I look at the instructions. The first, that's the first thing you need to do. Uh, when is the deadline? How long is the script? What are the expectations? All those things. Are, are, is this something that um, I am able to do um, within the deadline? And if not, obviously, I'm not going to commit to it. Uh, but I don't think there's ever been a, a job that I've refused because the expectations were too high from the client or from Voice Bunny. Voice Bunny is very generous when it comes to allowing, you know, how much time you have to do a job. Um, I forgot how many words were in the, the, the job that I did, but it took me 20 minutes to record it and I was allowed almost seven hours to do it. Uh, but you wanna make sure that you can fulfill all those requirements before you accept the job. And then you click accept and then it's time to go to work. So, um, the, uh, the best thing that you want to do too, is make sure that the, the script is right for you. You want to, you want to read the script, make sure that the, uh, the wording is clear. The pronunciations are, are things that are attainable. There are different ways that, uh, you know, you, you can find pronunciation through, uh, YouTube, et cetera, and all that. And if you have questions, just ask. Uh, there's no reason to be shy when it comes to asking any questions as to pronunciation or, you know, how a certain things de needs to be read. So if that answers your question, uh, Angela, as, as far as, you know, how I initially approach a job on, on Voice Bunny. Perfect. Thank you very much. That, I think that that was great. And I think that it really explains um, everything that I was asking for and even more. So um, now let's get to the part that we were all looking for. So how do you do, what do you do to get that perfect take right off the bat for a voice Benny project? What do you do? Um, what is your thought process? What are the steps that you go through? So l we were talking a little bit about what do you do before recording? So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, let's see if I can bring this up. Now this is not allowing me to share a screen. I wanted to bring up a script uh, to show you how I approach this, but um, look at the script, read the script, make sure it's something that you understand. And you need to ask yourself a couple of questions before you start uh, reading a script. Uh, the, the one difference between the way we do voiceover at home and our own personal studio, our own private studio and uh, the way it's done when you have a director and there's a client in the room, you know, other than when, uh, you know, have someone, when you have someone in real time directing you remotely is that you're on your own. You need to direct yourself. It's not just reading the script. Anybody, by the way, there's a ton of people out there with great voices that can read. That's not what this is all about. It, this goes beyond being able to read and having a good voice. This has everything to do with connecting with the words in the script, with allowing yourself to sound like you are creating these words. Whatever the mechanism is that is in your brain that creates language, 
that goes through whatever the process is when the synapses fire in your in your brain and the neurons and, and elect whatever the electrical connections are in your brain that transfer the thought process into speech that's what you're trying to do when you're reading a script so in order to do that you need to be as familiar as you can be with the words in the script so the last thing you want to do before you understand what is going on in the script is to understand what the meaning of the script. So don't read the script out loud right away. You may fall into a certain way of reading it that's just not right. And uh, you'll fall into this, this habit or, or this certain way of reading the script that's, that's not correct. You need to understand a few things before you read the script. So ask yourself a few questions. First of all, how will I direct myself? Uh, meaning if there were a director or, or a client in the room who uh, uh, w was asking you to read a certain way and there isn't, well, then you have to do that yourself. How do you, how do you connect to that message then? How do, how, do you ask, direct, uh, how do you direct yourself? You do that by asking yourself even more questions like what is the message in the piece? What is being said or, or what exactly uh, is the message that, that the client is relaying. You also need to, to identify who you're speaking to. Who, who are the people that are in the audience? Is it one person? Is it multiple people? Is it someone you know well? Or is it someone that you don't know well? We talk to different people in different ways. You talk to strangers differently than you would talk to a loved one, differently than you'd talk to your best friend, differently than you'd talk to your boss at work. All of those things matter. What is your relationship to the person that you're speaking to as well. You need to figure those things out first before you just go ahead and read the script. And I guarantee you, every one of you listening right now has read the script without asking yourself those questions. You just start reading in, your, in whatever you consider your best quote unquote announcer voice and turn that in. And that's not the way to do it. We all have our best announcer voice. I call that a default reading style. And and, and that just means you read it in whatever you think is your best voice over voice. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your voice sounds like. It matters whether or not you're connected to the meaning of the script. Again, there are people out there with beautiful voices. Gosh, I wish I had the, I wish I had the voice, possessed the voice of, of so many people are out there that just sounded so resonant and, and, and beautiful and, and, and uh, mellifluous. But you got, you've got what you got to work with. So uh, the way to make your performance really resonate and really connect is by connecting to that message. So in order to learn how you're going to get through the script, I recommend th three steps. First, don't read it out loud. Read it to yourself slowly. Uh, and I mean this slowly. In fact, I'll read the slide that's on the, uh, the screen right now. Before reading the script out loud, read the script silently and slowly. Read the script, then second step, read the script out loud with no inflection and slowly. Again, we're still trying to answer those questions. Who are we talking to? What is the message? Uh, what is my relationship to the listener? Uh, when you're reading the script out loud with no inflection and slowly, you're developing a, a bit of muscle memory when it comes to connecting with the script. Just getting used to saying those words. Uh, sometimes a transition from one word to the next can be very difficult, or some of the words can be difficult. Uh, for example, uh, say the word uh, chronosynclastic infundibulum is one of the words in the script. How the heck are you going to be able to pronounce that right away? And I'll, I'll you know, like, like you own the word. You can't. You need to, to say that word and you need to make sure that you can say it like you own it, like you're familiar with the word and like you sound as, as if you sound knowledgeable. And then the most important thing, and I'm closing my eyes now because, because I do this often, is to visualize saying these words to a real person in a real scenario, really talking to somebody. If these are... Uh, if, if I'm doing a uh, commercial about the great, the best steak restaurant in town, um, I'm not just going to start start reading 
hey, Blah Blah Blah's restaurant is the greatest steak restaurant in town. You're going to love it. They've got this, 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 and this. That's not how I talk to people. If I want to communicate an idea like what the greatest steak restaurant in town is, I'm going to say, Angela, Juan, you're not going to believe this, but I'm telling you, for this price, I had the best steak I've ever had. It was delicious. And I might just sort of, I call it ramping up. You sort of ad lib into the script a little bit where you're, you're talking to real people. And then you just slowly and seamlessly blend into the words that are into the script, that are, that are the script, so that it, it doesn't even sound different. It sounds no different from the ad lib to the script. It's a way to find your voice before you start reading the script. Rather than, again, reading in that default style, uh, you're connecting to the message by visualizing, speaking to real people uh, very passionately and, and with urgency about something that you care about. So those are the first steps that I take uh, before I consider the read. And uh, let's face it, we're all human and we see the dollar signs and we have deadlines and other things on our mind and, and we need to get the work in. But I'm telling you, it's worth it to take the extra five or 10 minutes to consider all those things, uh, all the things that I just spoke about before uh, submitting your read. If you're doing contests and speedies and all that, I guarantee you, guarantee you, your batting average will be so much higher if you take your time in trying to imagine scenarios and imagine real people and connecting to the message in the script rather than just glancing at the script and, and just reading it and, and submitting it. Does that make sense? Totally. It makes yeah. a lot of sense. Sorry to just keep flapping, but I get carried away. <laughs> no, actually, it, it's great. I mean, I believe that the more detail that, that, that we get on this, I believe it's going to be super useful for all of us. I think that this is something that some of us just go over and skip um, taking into account, like, you know, getting used to doing it and just doing it yeah. all the time. There, these are things that you may forget from time to time. So it's mm. important to always remember that. It's we get very into habits. We get yeah, into, like, we need to drop totally. things. And, and when I'm coaching people, uh, you know, when I, I, I coach a few people as well and, and produce demos and things, when I coach them, that's the number one thing that we work on is breaking out of that habit of just reading scripts um, in your quote unquote best announcer voice. It, that's not what it's about. It's not about the quality of your voice. Um, certainly, you may have been blessed with uh, a, a fine tool, you know, being your voice. But it, uh, success in this goes way beyond having a nice voice and having the ability to read smoothly. It has everything to do with truly connecting to and believing in what you're saying. Put yourself in the shoes of the client who's spending all this money on, on uh, a voiceover talent. You know, what, what would you want your, your talent to sound like if they were talking about your business? You would want that talent to, to sound like they truly believe that what they're talking about is the very best in that product category of whatever you're talking about, rather than just talking in a really nice voice and thinking that that's going to get the job done. <laughs> that's not the way it works. Not at all. Totally. Totally. I agree with you completely. So um, the next part here is more just about... Just really quick, um, just for you guys to know, like the third and the fifth most frequent reason of rejection is due to not following the script, the third one, and the fifth one is for not following the instructions close enough. So that's uh, something that happens pretty frequently. Yeah, we also get a lot of rejections for like robotic or monotonic sounding. So mm -hmm. for example, those reads are you're just basically going over what's what says there and you're not even thinking what is trying to convey. That's another very um, common rejection reason. And I believe that what you mentioned is very important to be that one person, that one talent that doesn't do that and actually rises to the top and shows the clients and shows us as well that what you are doing is clearly um, something that has been thought on. Sure. Like you are really thinking about it before you're recording, which is 
totally, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely, Angela. And Juan, what you're saying is important. The thing about the instructions, following the script carefully, and uh, the whole part about being robotic, um, that's just reading it. Again, that's that default reading style. Uh, if you can take a little bit of a, a risk in the read, and I don't mean go crazy, but in, in, in making your read unique, uh, you're going to take a little bit of a risk. Uh, and it's got to make sense. I mean, I, I could scream the script and that would make it different or whisper it, but it just wouldn't make sense. But if I do something that's a little bit different um, in, in the way that I read it, certainly that's, that's taking a little bit of a risk, but uh, you know, no risk, no reward. Um, so certainly the most straightforward, most robotic way to read it, the most careful way to read it would, would certainly uh, meet all the requirements that the, the client is looking for. And, and, you know, of course the stringent requ quality requirements that, that voice bunny looks for. Sure. You can meet those, but unless you take a little bit of a chance and, you know, how you approach that read, uh, you know, you, you're going to go a little bit farther uh, in, in, by taking that risk, by taking a little bit more of a chance, by uh, maybe being a little more emotive, uh, by being, you know, slightly more e excited about what you're talking about, a little more quirky in the delivery, something that just, just makes your read unique, whether it's in the phrasing or in the emotional energy, uh, something that makes it your own. And that's what we call owning the script, something that makes your uh, your read, totally unique. And I know uh, Juan and Angela, in listening to uh, auditions and, and different reads from people, you'll hear the same phrasing. Uh, you'll hear that the people just with the, with the same sort of rhythm and melody and tone and all that, and, and it all sort of sounds the same. And then there's that one read that you hear that's just so different. And it's like, yeah, that's it. That person gets it. They're taking that chance. They're, they're, they're taking a little bit of a risk in uh, in their delivery, chances are the client's going to feel the same way. Uh, would you agree? And definitely, definitely. Most of our clients are looking for natural and, and conversational kind of of voiceovers. So that's definitely something that it's uh, that it's really important to to achieve on the first on the first take. For sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So ask yourself those questions. How will you direct yourself? What is the message? Who am I speaking to? What's my relationship to the listener? And, and that's going to make you sound far more conversational. And it's, it's going to help you sound uh, far more natural and, and organic in your delivery, I guess is the word that I'm looking for. Yeah, totally. I agree with you completely. So um, now to the next part that I believe that this is also very, very important whenever you are going to start recording. So is how do you set your equipment? How do you set your preamp if, like your um, yeah, preamplifier? How do you set your interface, um, your microphone? Do you use pads? Like how do you set everything to make sure that when you get to that microphone and you start recording that perfect take, it's going to be perfectly recorded into your microphone and you're going to see it in your um, software perfectly and that you just don't miss the perfect chance because of not setting everything right. right. What well, do you do? Levels are absolutely so important. Levels that are too low or too high are, are problems. And immediately clients and the voice bunny folks who, are, who, who want to be so careful, that's why they, they do those initial quality reviews before they send your, uh, your reads onto the clients. They want to make sure that there's a, a, a professional technical sound to your read. And that's 50% of it. 50% is, is the quality of the read. The other half is the, is the technical aspects. You want to make sure that everything is consistent, that your, your levels are consistent. So I always shoot for levels that are between minus six dB and minus three dB. Um, and, and the way to, to set those levels is not by looking at numbers on knobs. Um, for example, and I'll just show you a little bit about how my, like, for example, my preamp here, um, you know, there's, there's numbers here, but that has nothing to do with what my levels are going to be. 
uh, you know, it's sort of a guideline, but different reads are going to require, excuse, I hope you don't get seasick from me moving the camera around. Um, sometimes the, uh, my delivery might be a little more hushed like this. And sometimes I may project a little bit more like this. And notice how, and I get a little bit, little bit closer to the mic when my delivery is softer. And when I project more, I back off the mic. And sometimes, you know, I will use, um, I, I will turn the input up a little bit with the mic. Or if I'm going to go a little bit louder, I'm going to turn it down just to make sure those levels are consistent. But what you need to do is make sure that the average level is between minus 6 dB and minus 3 dB. And how do you do that? Not by just going test, check, one, two, three, check, 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 check. You need to read the script in the, in the level or volume that you're going to be delivering the script in. Um, other, uh, otherwise, if you just go test, test, check, one, two, three, one, two, three, and you set your levels, and then all of a sudden your, your, uh, your projection, the way you project the, uh, the delivery is, you know, way loud like this, you're just going to blast the client's eardrums out with, uh, you know, th through the headphones. Uh, make sure that you set your level at, at the level that you're going to be speaking at. Uh, and that way it will be always consistent. And then make sure, and it doesn't matter what recording software you use, 99% of them, whether you're using, I use uh, Sony SoundForge as my recording software. Uh, others might use Adobe Audition, Audacity. I'm not a huge fan of, but if that, that's what you use. You know, that's fine. They all have normalize functions. And normalize does exactly what it says it does. It normalizes your recording volume. Or not your recording volume, but your, your playback volume. So set that at minus 3 dB. So it, what it's going to do is bring up the lower levels into a higher, higher range and bring down the higher levels to a lower range so that you get a consistent normalized level each time. Uh, levels are so underrated and so important when it comes to the quality of your read. Uh, I don't know what the statistics are at Voice Bunny, but I would venture to, to, to guess, and Juan and Angela would have the, the numbers on this, that uh, there are as many projects rejected because the levels are bad as because of the delivery being bad. Uh, it, it's everything. Uh, the, the, your, the quality of your audio recording, I'm not just talking about the delivery, but noise and buzz and, and, and levels and all that say a lot about who you are as, as a voice artist. And if you don't take the same amount of care uh, in that aspect of, of your recording uh, as you do in, in delivery, then you know, you're only serving 50% of the equation. It's, it's, it's half delivery, it's half technical. So make sure that you follow those numbers very carefully. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, actually, um, levels are super important. We do, as you were mentioning, we do get a lot of rejections because of the volumes are not correct or not proper. And sometimes it's not even because the volume is too low, which is something very common, but also because it's too loud. So we get distortion and we get a lot of problems in that regard. I think that Juan Santiago has more numbers than that, but it really is very common and you can listen, even sometimes on the samples and on the demos that are uploaded, you can listen to that difference in volume that really doesn't let you appreciate the voice as you should because the volume is just either completely distorted or so low that the noise floor is just super high. Right, Juan Santiago? Yeah, and I would say that, I mean, some some voice, some talents want their voice to sound powerful and compress them up front, and uh, that's totally understandable. Uh, but it's important to understand that there is a, a recording stage uh, where you have to avoid clipping, for example, at all costs, or mm. recording too soft, so that the the amount of his, or even if you record too loud, you may get undesired levels of his and electrical noises. So you need to find the perfect balance to achieve like the best 
quality uh, possible with the recording setup you have and and then once it's it's printed printed in your DAW you need to make sure that um, but the deliverable you submit is is also uh, within that range of volume expected so we always expect the volume to be around minus 3 dB peak full scale um, as we want most of our clients have neither to little or none interest in, in editing audio or have the editing tool. So we want to make sure that they can use the files right away if they need to, or that they're um, sufficiently unprocessed in case they want to make some extra processing later. So that's like a, a, a middle point yeah. which we try to, to um, ask for. Yeah, I, I was going to mention that too once the end ago, that the... the, the uh... Uh, the other part of that too is some people can do a little bit too much, uh, of, of, avoid compression, uh, of, avoid EQing if you can, unless you have a really bad microphone that, uh, and you're not getting enough highs or lows or whatever, you need to correct for that. But um, sometimes, and I'm sure you've heard this, the, the files can be way over processed and that's a problem too, especially if, Maybe you're doing a good job and you, you process the file and then you need to make a correction. How, do you remember what you did to process that file so that you can match up the tone of that file if you have to do a correction? It's difficult sometimes to do that. Right. Yeah, and completely. It goes for the samples, for example. Some people like to have their samples like completely limited and it's the, the, the volume is just like breaking this the, the speaker uh and then it, it becomes a problem when a client likes that type of sound but it's completely distorted and and, and over limited uh so it's for the quality control team it's really hard to um, we need to to have a balance of what the the client what type of sound is the client looking for what did they like from the from your sample but also how can the audio be within the quality the standards that that we look for agree Absolutely. exactly sometimes sometimes less is more and i think that sometimes given how the industry sounds and what you listen to in the television or in video games or even in radio it sounds very different because they they are already adding a lot of processing so when the voiceover is already super processed you believe that that's better but it's not because most of the time everyone is going to add more processing the radio adds processing tv adds processing video games at processing tv shows everything they have their own very specific processing that they have to add so whenever you are doing a lot of things and too many processes to that audio most of the time when you're doing is damaging the recording more than actually fixing it or cleaning it so i think that that's also something that is worth mentioning and worth like keeping in mind yeah yeah when, when i coach and people ask uh, you know, what sort of processing should I be doing? Uh, I'd say the only processing you should be doing is checking your levels and normalizing, and that's it. And you know, let, let the clients and the uh, producers do the rest. Totally. Uh, they, they I think, I think the best thing you can do is try to achieve the best recording as clean as possible. Because every time you add a, a, a new layer of processing, the audio will be degraded in a certain way. Uh, so and it becomes like a, a chain flow so make sure you try to get the best recording right from the start only using the your microphone the mic placement and the 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 like the gain or not even an EQ I would say I would agree with Tommy totally Okay, so let's get to the next part so now that we know all of this and we've got great insights on before you're recording and what you should keep an eye on when you're doing this voiceover recordings. Now, when you are doing the recording where you're already on it and you're right on your microphone, mm -hmm. what do you do? What would you say that it's important for all of us voice actors to keep in mind when you are recording that perfect take? Uh, to get that perfect take, and this is one thing I noticed with uh, a woman I was, I was working with uh, earlier today, uh, she would click record and then just start reading all of a sudden. Um, she, she wasn't relaxed. And that's the number one thing. 
you really need to be relaxed. Uh, the next time that you you watch uh, an actor or actress actor on television or listen to a voiceover, um, listen to how unaffected they sound by being so relaxed. Uh, if you feel any sort of anxiety whatsoever, then you need to go take a walk uh, and just take a deep breath and relax. Uh, make sure that you are comfortable uh, because when we speak, it's very evident that uh, how people are feeling um, can certainly be heard in the way people speak. When someone's nervous, you can hear it in their voice. When there's a certain amount of anxiety, when you're, you know, your mind is racing and you've got, uh, you know, I got to get this done by a certain amount of time and this and this and that and that, uh, you know, you, you need to step away from that. So you got to make sure that you're relaxed and make sure that you, you focus on the words. Way too many people speak way too fast. And I would bet that that was, that's a common rejection reason. And, um, Angela and Juan Santiago, I'm sure you could, you can attest to this, that you get, um, reads from people that are just way too fast. We speak w way faster than we think we do when we're reading. If it, if you are reading a script and it feels like you are laboring just a little bit, like you're just going a little bit too slow, you're probably doing it just right. So make sure that you slow down, that you're relaxed. Again, relaxed enough to visualize what's going on. Visualize the words that you're speaking. Use the words to help you. Um, for example, if I were reading a, a documentary script about, say, Eleanor Roosevelt, and um, the, the words in the script were, Eleanor Roosevelt was loved and admired. If uh, I just said, Eleanor Roosevelt was loved and admired, I'm missing uh, those gifts, those nuggets that are in there that are inherent in the words, the word loved and admired. They have their own feel to it. So take advantage of those words, those little nuggets of gold. Mrs. Roosevelt was loved and admired. You hear the difference between just saying loved and admired and loved and admired. Take advantage of those, those gifts that those words afford you. Uh, and the only way that you can do that is by slowing down. If you're glossing over the meaning of words, uh, like uh, there was another script I was doing today about uh, people in North Carolina who live in the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, and I think the words were, uh, these, folks live in the, these folks live in the wild and savage Smoky Mountains. Certainly you can say these, these people live in the wild and savage Smoky Mountains. Well, I'm not using the words to to generate emotion. They live in the wild and savage Smoky Mountains. Take advantage of the, of, of the meaning of those words that generate a certain feel and use the, the meaning of those words to generate that emotion. Connect with those words and, and think visually. Think about what you're describing and then act vocally. Think visually, act vocally. Go slowly, take your time. If you feel like you're laboring through the script, you're probably right on. Remember, people listening to your narration don't have the luxury of going back and, and reading whatever it is that they missed. Once it's gone, it's gone. When you're reading something to yourself, you can always, oh yeah, okay, I missed that, I can go back. But to someone who is listening, they don't have that luxury. So you need to afford them the time to absorb everything that you're saying. Take your time. It's going to feel like it's going way too slow, but you're not. You're not. I like to say luxuriate in the words. Every word is there for a reason. Every word is as important as the next. Even the word is or a uh, or the is as important as any noun or verb, you know, that, that is part of the script. Uh, people are, are paid a lot of money to write these scripts. Um, take advantage of, of the gift that they give you in those words. Don't just race through it. It's not a race to the end. It's, 
It's something that should be enjoyed. So that's why I say luxuriate in the words. Uh, imagine yourself in a hot tub full of words and they're just bubbling around you. Enjoy it. Luxuriate in the words. Give each word its due and say each word. Uh, don't amalgamate the words. If I were to say, well, I just did it. If I were to say, that sounds like one word. If I were to say, if I were to say, if those are the words in a script, I wouldn't say, if I were to say, as if it were spelled as one word, if I were to say, if I were to say, don't do that. Unless the direction calls for that sort of down home kind of casual conversational, if I were to say, then you can do that. But if you are uh, narrating something, if I were to say, it makes a huge difference. So again, make sure that each word is given its due. Uh, do you do you both run into a lot of uh, reads that just go too fast? Yeah, that that that's a frequent rejection we get from our clients. Sometimes they say that they the talent didn't follow instructions, that they wanted something slow paced and natural, and it sounds more like a like a, like a learn script. So it goes too fast, and it has like this commercial rhythm. Uh, so that, that totally throws it off from, from what they are expecting. And remember too, there are, there are visuals associated with these words uh, on the screen. So you need to take your time. There needs to be a certain pace to make sure that you're not going faster than the visuals on the screen. So right now it seems like I'm speaking a little bit too slowly, but if I'm narrating something that is synced up with video here comes another image and another image and i'm just taking my time that's generally the right way to do it so uh, generally we speak way faster than we think we do and we speak flatter than we think we do um, in general conversation when you're speaking to another person and, and by flatter i mean emotionally flatter our vocal range, um, the, the highs, by vocal range, I mean, let me speak with a, with a broader vocal range. So I'm speaking now with a broader vocal range. My highs are higher and my lows are lower. So it sounds like I am speaking with far more emotion because I'm going up higher and I'm going down lower. Uh, we generally speak way flatter than we think we do. It feels like uh, we're speaking with a broader vocal range uh, so make sure that you use those higher notes and those lower notes in, in, that, in that sort of vocal melody. When we speak, even though we're not singing, the script does have a melody. Uh, so make sure that you, you utilize all of that vocal range that you have when you go up and when you go down. So to back up, we speak faster than we think we do, and we speak with less vocal range than we think we do. So uh, if it feels like you're going too slow and it feels like you're speaking a little bit over the top emotionally, you're probably right on. You're probably right where it needs to be. Uh, so that's, those are things to consider as well while you're trying to attain or trying to uh, get that perfect read. Awesome. Thank you. I totally agree with you. So now um, to the next part and the last part of this um, section. So when you are already done recording and you already said, okay, well, this is what it is. Um, when you listen to the recording, when you're playing it back, what are like the practices that you would have? The litmus test that I use is, um, uh, again, think visually, act vocally. When you're listening back to your take. Uh, imagine that you're talking to a real person and saying these words that are in the script when you listen back. Does, does it sound like a, a real conversation? Does it sound normal and natural? Or does it sound like uh, it's got this announcer feel, like it's a little bit manufactured or, or stilted, as I say? If so, then you need to, you need to go back and, again, uh, maybe use that ramp up technique where you just sort of ad lib into the script to make sure that it sounds like, uh, you know, you're talking to a real person. Uh, on the technical side, I use 
um, uh, b- because you know the quality is very important, and you don't need to spend thousands of dollars on headphones. But good quality closed ear headphones are very important to catch any of um, what we call uh, artifacts. You know, any any glitches, noises, uh, buzzes, clicks, pops, dogs barking, sirens. You know, any of those things. Um, that you necessarily you wouldn't necessarily catch if you're listening through speakers. So, uh, you know, make sure that your performance is okay by doing that lit- litmus test of does it does it sound like I'm talking to a real person? Use your headphones to catch you know the technical aspects, and then of course, uh, I like to do it at least three times. Read along with the script when you're listening back to make sure you didn't miss any words or mispronounce any words. Uh, I've actually checked my work two and three times and then suddenly there was a mistake. We're all human. You know, it's, it's easy to, uh, it's easy to make mistakes. So make sure that you haven't left out any words, make sure that it's all there. Uh, You know, we, we talk about removing breaths and all that, you know, if there's a slight natural breath, that doesn't call attention to itself, you don't have to get rid of that. If it's like you're gasping for air, um, you know, that's a different story. But, uh, you know, take the time to get rid of anything that calls attention to itself and diverts attention away from the meaning or or from the actual uh, message in there. And, uh, you know, again, listen to that file after, uh, after you upload it to make sure it goes properly before you click send or upload or submit is, is the, uh, the button on, uh, on voice bunny, you know, just make sure that you've uploaded the correct file because, you know, sometimes file names are, uh, very similar and I'm, I'm sure you've all had the wrong file submitted and, and people do that. It's just, it's sort of an embarrassing mistake, but it's something that can happen to anybody. Awesome. Thank you very much. So I totally agree with this. I think that, I mean, you can do a lot, everything that we said before, but if you miss this last part and you don't listen, you may make some mistakes that can cost that project and can cost you that, um, like, yeah, that approval right off the bat from our quality control team. Okay. So I think this is the moment that we were all waiting for. This is our Q&A section. So um, we have already received some questions. We have nine. If you have more questions, please go ahead and add them. The Q&A section actually is in the lower part of your Zoom panel. So just go ahead and add it there. Let's get started with the question. So um, Sean Chaplock asked, have you ever reached a point with a voice bunny client where you couldn't meet the revision request anymore? If so, what was the cutoff point for you in terms of meeting their needs and how did you handle turning down their request? I don't think I've ever turned down a request. Um, uh, and you, uh, you guys, you kids could probably uh, answer this better than I could. I always just submit the very best that I could do. Um, you know, I, there are some clients that, you know, are a little more, a little bit more difficult than others. Um, uh, and then there, there are sometimes there's like a go between and, uh, Angela, you and I have discussed this where the, there might be two or three people in between the voice talent and the client. And there's a, this chain of communication that can get a little bit confusing. Um, so what I, um, what I do is just offer the best that I can do. And if the client doesn't like it, you know, I'm sorry, I've done my best. And, um, you know, it's, it's not like you're not going to get paid. Um, if, if, if voice bunny feels that you've turned in, um, you know, a good job and you feel that you've, you've done a good job, well, you know, maybe it just didn't work out. And sometimes that happens, but um, I don't think I've ever turned down a request for, uh, for fixing a, for fixing a job. Yeah, totally. I mean, I agree with Tommy. I think that for this type of projects, it's a matter of um, 
not only just doing the best that you can based on what the client is saying and the remarks and of course your experience as a voice talent but also communicating with us as well um sometimes when the remarks are not clear we all get that from time to time um it's a matter of telling us i mean our production management team is always very open to actually go ahead and ask a kind for further remarks and for further feedback and even if that makes the project delay a little bit or even if that makes um the project get a little bit longer um in the deadline that it has sometimes it can be better to do that and get less revisions then just like go ahead and just submit whatever without actually understanding or knowing what you're doing. That's what we were also mentioning at the beginning of, of the webinar. You have to understand the script and you have to understand the requirements that are needed in like for the project right off the bat. So I think that if, if that happens or if you feel that the project because of delays or waiting for more feedback is going to get a little bit held back or your stats are going to be affected, we're always there. I am always there to review the cases. And in that case, we can even take it off your stats if that's the case. But I believe that it's a matter of doing the best that you can with what you got and with the experience that you have and with the type of projects that you have done that are similar to that before and communicating with us. Um, I think that that's, that that's one of the, of the pillars of, of, of completing and getting those projects right off the bat and with the less number of revisions. Um, so the next questions, question again from Sean Chaplock is, what is one thing that you feel Voice Bunny excels at in comparison to other voiceover popular casting websites today? And one thing you feel it falls short at or like could get better at? Um, boy, Voice Bunny excels at so many different things. Um, I, I just love the fact that you can uh, work with the platform the way you want to work with it. Um, for example, I don't audition for any jobs on Voice Bunny, and I probably get at, uh, I probably average at least one job a day from Voice Bunny uh, from bookings. Um, so, because I choose to to work that way without having to go through the whole mess of auditioning up against you know 150 different people. Um, and because I can set my own rates, I don't have to worry that, you know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, $4 jobs at the same time. Um, that's a huge advantage. It's a huge advantage. Um, what's one thing I think that they fall short at or could improve? I think voice bunny could do a better job of uh, letting people know how how easy it is to work with them. I, I, I think that it's an underrated service as far as voice talent goes. Um, I, 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 I think it's there. I think voice bunny is quite often misunderstood as to how it works. I think if more people understood that um, you have far more control over how you can get work and how you can get paid and how well you can do with that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's going to hurt me more because it's, it's going to make things more competitive or not. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't think enough voice talent understands uh, what a great service it is that's out there. Um, I think more and more people are catching on, uh, but, but that's, you know, that's just a minor thing. Um, to me, it's like a best kept secret. So don't tell anyone else. <laughs> Don't tell anyone else how much money you can make on Voice Bunny. Well, okay, maybe I think that this is going to be live in our community space and it's yeah. going to go on Facebook, so it's I'm not going to be that that private anymore. But yeah, um, thank you very much for that. So next, for the next question, um, this is from Chancho, and he asked how low the rates should be, like, I believe, to get started. Yeah. Um, that's up to you. I mean, that's such a personal question. Um, it's whatever you think you're worth. Um, you know, obviously you need to be competitive, but uh, when it comes to, you know, how low they should go, it's, you know, it's, it's what you think you're worth. And, um, you know, it's, 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 I don't, I don't, I'm not a computer specialist. So as far as the algorithms go um, and how your rankings 
um, will come up when it comes to uh, to voice money. I do know that lower rates will help you, um, but I always tell people, um, my students, uh, and I, I always tell them, all of them, to uh, sign up for Voice Bunny. By the way, I don't know if you know this or not, Voice Bunny is free. Uh, most people don't don't know that. Uh, but to, but to get going and, and to get started, um, you know, just just start low, and then as you get jobs, you can slowly increment, slowly and incrementally, raise your rates. And before long, you know, after a few weeks or a few months, um, you know, you're up there at, at a competitive rate. So you know, don't be, uh, you know, don't be too shy about uh, making your, your rates too low at the beginning. It will catch up. And you will still you will start to um, to make some good good coin as they say. With, yeah, uh, totally, with totally. I agree with that. Go. I agree with that. I believe that with the rates is a ma it's a matter of understanding what you have, your experience, your equipment, how savvy you are, how much time availability you're having, how fast turnaround times you can give it's a little bit of a combination of everything but it's up to you i mean it will depend on what you believe it's going to be worth um for your for your work we will never ask you to do things for a lower rate because it is always up to what you believe sometimes it will enter to negotiate i will not say that we won't but if we negotiate most of the time is for very big projects or for very specific reasons and we will never force you to do that so i believe that starting with the rates you should first of all feel comfortable um even if they're low you shouldn't just go low that you feel bad about it but you should go low that you still feel comfortable and that you still feel that you're getting a fair compensation compensation for your work so i believe that it's a matter of just understanding the work that you're doing how mm. much you believe in yourself and how much you think that your talent your voice is worth of for so that's something that nobody can tell you that will come naturally from you and that will come from what you believe it's um it will come from you. So um, to the next question from Luis Fernando Gutierrez is, how do I get a competitive rate compared to other speakers? So I think that this is something that we just answered. Um, as Tony and I were mentioning, um, it's a matter of what you believe it's going to work for you. Um, you have your spaces you have your equipment there you can have a studio for five hundred dollars and or you can have a ten thousand dollar studio you can be working at your home or you can be renting a studio though all of these are things that are going to be um determining how much you should be charging and our clients we have clients for various budgets so even if you have lower rates or you have big rates or you have medium rates or whatever, um, it's a matter of showing off and showcasing and charging for what you have and for what you believe that you can offer. Um, now, the next question from Diane, um, it's what software do you use to record? I believe that's for Tommy. Yep, I use um, Sony software. Um, it's Sony uh, SoundForge. Uh, which is great for a, a PC. Um, the Mac version is, is more expensive, uh, but I always uh, recommend for anyone on a PC to use Sony SoundForge because um, it's only like $39 or $49 for the whole thing, and it's perfect for voiceover. It, uh, I've, I've got seven or eight different softwares on my system that I use to record, but a lot of them, um, are just too much. I mean, I could record, uh, you know, the London Philharmonic with 64 tracks, you know, it's, but why would I use that to record soft, uh, to record uh, the voiceover when I have software that can just record the one track? Um, it's it's kind of like going to the hardware store and buying a sledgehammer when you just need a fly swatter. Uh, so what, what I think um, uh, people should consider uh, for PC is Sony SoundForge 10. Um, used to be made by Sony. Now it's made by a company called Magix with an X. And then for for uh, Mac users, uh, I think Adobe Audition is uh, a, a great 
software to use. Audacity is fine. It's free, but you get what you pay for. You have to go, you got to jump through cert, certain hoops to convert files to an MP3 and it can be very difficult. And to the point where voice bunnies had to put special instructions on their, uh, on their website to explain how to convert files and export files, you know, using audacity. Uh, there are easier ways to, uh, to record and to, uh, you know, to use different uh, file formats um, rather than audacity. But again, you know, you get what you pay for. Yeah, totally. I agree with that. Um, I personally use Pro Tools. Um, I have Pro too. Tools HD 10. I really like it, but that's also because I'm a professional um, music producer and audio engineer. Mm -hmm. So I believe that also depends a lot on the experience that you have. This software is, there are softwares for every single type of user. So I believe that it also depends on how how tech savvy you are and how um, used to you are to this to 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 using this type of software. So if you are more on on the tech savvy and you know a lot about engineering and you know about plugins and you know a lot about like audio lingo, I believe that Pro Tools is a great option. Logic Pro X is another amazing DAW. Um, but there are various options out there. If you're not that um, used to all of these things and you are may not be that professional, you can use the Sony SoundForge. There's also Reaper. That's a great option as well. I believe the Reese also has some um, audio yeah. option right now. There are various out there. I believe that it's a matter of getting used to each of them. None of them is worse than the other. You just get what you um, what works best for you, and it will depend a lot on how much how used you get to that. So, just my advice on that regard would be just try a lot of them. You can get free trials for most of them. Yeah. and choose the one that you that you prefer the most yeah. um there are some of them that are really expensive like pro tools i believe that's like 800 dollars, and logic pro it's like 500 but i believe it's a matter of you just getting used to them and right. knowing how much you're going to be using them as well and soundforge like i said um 39 or 49 and that's all i use and i've got pro tools and i've got you know adobe audition and i've got uh, gosh so many different uh, of course, uh, there's Audacity there. Studio One, I've got. I'm just looking yeah, at. Yeah, there are a the lot. Uh, but again, it, it's not necessary. You're just you're recording one mono track when you're doing voiceover. Uh, yeah. There's no need for any of that other stuff. Yeah, just try them out and find the one that's perfect for you. Um, mm -hmm. So. Next question from Justin Landreth. It's with a contest or, well, secret projects, I believe it's Speedies. Um, I've gotten lately, it's nearly impossible to start, finish the project, export and upload before the submission button won't allow more submissions. So that, question's, that question is more for me. Um, yeah. When you get those type of invitations, you have to accept them right off the bat. What happens with that is that we allow you some certain very specific amount of time for contest and speedies for you to actually submit. Um, for contest, we're actually expecting a very short um, file. So we do not give you those seven hours that Tony was talk that Tommy was talking about in with the bookings because the booking is more specific for just one voice and we want you to make sure that that take is perfect. However, with the contest, um, it works a little bit different because we want just to give a glimpse to the client on how it works. So the time that we allow is basically for you to go in, record the audition that most of the time is just no longer that 50 words. You record, you edit lightly, as, as we were explaining before with, with Tommy, we do not expect you to have this super produced and mastered file, just a very clean and to the point file and submit. So, um, I believe it's a matter of, first of all, you get the invitation and you accept it. Before you hit the recording booth, before you do everything, before you read the script, just go ahead, make sure that you know what the project is about, you read the remarks, you understand if you can do it or not, and you accept it. This is because these projects get taken so fast because we're not just inviting you, we're inviting basically all our talent base for that project that actually matches. So for example, in English North America, keep in mind that we have more or less 2000 voice actors. So 
you are not the only one getting invited to that and we only have three spots per contest and only one spot for speedy so it's a matter for you to understand that if you're going to be taking the challenge of taking a speedy, you have to accept it right away and start recording right off the bat. That way, you're going to be able to save a spot for some a lot of time. And then um, if you win, well, you're going to be able to get more time to record the full voiceover. But for the contest, you have to be very scrappy, you have to be very fast, and you have to be able to understand very well what the project is about. So um, on to the next question from Joe Brookhouse. So outside of ensuring excellent audio and performance, what are strategies for landing voice bunny projects? That's also for Tommy. Strategies for landing them. Um, having good solid demos. And I think you both can talk a little bit more about um, how that works. Um, I know quite often some of the work, some of the uh, completed work that you get from Voice Bunny will serve as demos on your file, but but uh, there's also the opportunity to upload uh, quality demos on Voice Bunny. And when you're just doing bookings like I am, I find that um, the better quality demos and uh, getting help uh, producing those demos, and, and, and that's another service that, that I uh, also offer if anyone wanted to contact me for coaching or, or demo production or whatever, um, uh, those demos can help. And, and maybe you two can talk a little bit more about how that works. Yeah, actually for this, I totally agree with Tommy. Um, it's a matter of having solid, straight to the point and very clean demos. I mean, if your samples are clear and you have in all the categories and you are showing your versatility, you are going to get jobs. I mean, trust me, we have had voice actors that have been working with us for three years or uh, like Tommy or four years like Sean that the and 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 the demos are very solid and you know you listen to them and you know what you're going for you know what you are going to get sometimes when you upload some demos that are just um that you just recorded them and you just uploaded them for the sake of having demos um clients know that clients know that it's not the perfect thing and that it's not going to be um what they are expecting so what I would say is just get yourself some straight, solid um, samples, um, very clean, very well edited, that show your versatility. Remember, you have 30 seconds, and those um, samples should be very clear and should be very um, representative of the job and of the work that you can deliver. Um, specific too. They have to be yeah, totally. specific to the category. Maybe you should talk a little bit about that, too. Yeah, also, I mean, we have ser we have several categories. Um, we have quite some of them. So it's also important to have demos in every category that you believe that you can deliver. If, for example, you're not a singer and you don't believe that you can um, upload a sing uh, like a singing um, sample, don't do it. Don't risk yourself because all of that is going to affect you. However, if you're great at doing live announcements, go ahead, show your voice, upload those demos, show what you can do. Just make sure that those samples are very specific of what you can do and in the categories that you are looking for. Our clients are usually very keen of using that search and book and that cat and those categories um 95 percent of our projects are bookings before like last year it was 85 percent and just in this four months it has already risen to 95 percent so we so it's very important for um all of us to understand that this is happening and that our clients are really going there and are going to those categories and are going to that search to look for your voices so the categories are very important you label them properly um i personally do not recommend you to use background music in your samples because clients also want to listen to the quality of the voice that they're going to get sometimes when you use music you are going to be covering i don't know some noises he is even um um reverberation or echoes or room noises that are going to be present in the voiceover that maybe you didn't notice and that the music is going to um be on top of so it's important for you to also notice that so um i believe that that would be on that front um the next question is again of the rates we already answered that 
Um, and the next question is from an anonymous viewer. That is, um, in the past month, I had three experiences experiences in which I was asked for a certain intention to start, but it was rejected in deliveries and request new intentions up to four times. My impression has been that the original petitioner in the chain of work does not realize, um, does not really know what they need. However, I understand that may be only my own impression. How do I keep control without it becoming a nightmare and the relationship between all involved in the project is the best possible? I think that's for you, Tommy. Um. I would say that you you just need to do the best work that you can do and uh, you know try to understand as clearly as as possible um, what it is that that client's looking for now if they keep coming back and saying you know this needs to be changed this needs to be changed and all that um, you know maybe uh, you know you two just aren't connecting what I find is that quite often the clients don't know exactly what they want, but they'll know it when they hear it. And it's up to you as a voice artist to use those tools that we talked about earlier, breaking down the scripts, trying to figure out, um, you know, what those deeper meanings are in, in the script and, and bringing those things to light. Remember we talked about taking those risks um, where you need to, uh, you know, go a little bit above and beyond and 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 try to make your uh, your read a little bit different than others. Um, but you know, I've you know, I've, I've I've I guess I've done close to three hundred jobs now. Three hundred booked about three hundred jobs with Voice Bunny over the last uh, couple of years or so. And um, you know, there have been a few that that just didn't work out, and that's natural. It happens. Um, you know, sometimes the client, again, just doesn't know what they want. And what they want is not within your range of ability. Um, and that's okay. Um, you know, so they move on and they, they find someone else. Um, if you find that that's happening consistently, where you're being hired and um, you're unable to deliver what the client's looking for, well, then maybe you should consider perhaps uh, a little more training or coaching and, uh, you know, learning a little bit more about how to interpret the script so that you can deliver what it is that the, uh, the client is looking for a little more specifically. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I would add that, I mean, we, we pay a lot of attention to the feedback we receive from our clients and, uh, as part of our 100% satisfaction guarantee, it's it's not uh, unfrequent that some clients reject only, I mean, based on the fact that, that maybe that, that the voice didn't sound right for the project, or sometimes even they can change their mind. So they, they, they would like a, a female voice instead now. So, I mean, there, there's a huge um, range of, of possibilities why why a client would reject their the project at the end um make sure you 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 read them thoroughly and understand to see if it was something maybe about your performance about following instructions um from the quality control perspective uh, we always review every rejection we get and if we see that the talent followed all the instructions that the quality they delivered is right and it's more of a of a client uh, opinion then we remove that project from your stats so that you won't be affected in any way uh, but it's definitely a natural i mean it's part of, of the game to 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 get rejected every now and then but yeah it shouldn't be like that frequent as tommy says one of the one of the tools too that um, Voice Bunny allows is that uh, you know let's say you have ten different demos on your profile and you are booked for a job. Um, the the sample that the the client liked uh, and it was pretty much the reason for why they hired you is included in the job description. So you can listen back to the sample that they liked, and that'll give you a little bit of a clue as to what the client's looking for. 
Sometimes that can be misleading, um, but it, it can give you a little bit of a hint as to uh, how to do the job. Uh, I've, I've found, you know, maybe one in a hundred jobs where the, the sample, you know, they liked the sample, but it, it wasn't what they were looking for as far as the performance. And, and that can be really confusing. And, and Voice Bunny has always been very generous, uh, you know, when we figure out that, you know, okay, I, I was trying to, uh, you know, match my performance up with the sample that they liked, but that's not what they were looking for when it, when it came to the read, you know, then, you know, uh, you know, then you kind of throw your hands up and, and, um, you know, as Juan said, and, and Angela will attest that, you know, they will, uh, they will take that rejection off your stats and you won't have to worry about that. But that's, that's few and far between. But if you find this to be a consistent issue, then I would absolutely consider um, coaching um, and, and learning a little bit more about how to interpret these, these uh, scripts that you're sent. And, and keep in mind, again, and I know both of you will, uh, will agree, you know, sometimes the client has no idea what the client wants, um, but they'll know it when they hear it. Totally. I agree completely with that. So um, with the next question, again, from Diane, this is still on the concept of rates. So um, she asks, will going low mean less experience, though? I don't believe that going lower mean less experience. Um, I believe that going that? lower. Does she mean that the client will, will believe if you go low that you are a less, less experienced voice talent? Is that what she's saying? Um, I believe um, if Diane is still here, I believe if you can help us clarify that. Um, yeah, Diane says that yes, maybe the client will believe that you have less experience because you're going lower. I don't think so. Um, I don't, I don't personally if the thinks that I don't think that matters. Um, you get the job. Um, you get that in your stats, that increases your ranking in the search profile, the, in the algorithms. And um, Diane, then that's your turn to raise your rates a little bit. So I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I believe that um, if you're good, if your voice sounds great, if you sound like you are experienced, and you sound professional and you're able to deliver a great recording, regardless of the rate that you have, that's going to be noticeable and the clients are going to notice and the clients are going to know. And if you raise your rates as well to show that, that's also fine. That's also important. I have learned a lot from this, um, from my experience here in Voice Benny, it is that clients know when a talent is good and when a voice actor is really doing a good job. And most of them are willing to pay a little bit more when that recording is what they're looking for and that recording is what they're worth. Sometimes um, we have a very common saying here in Colombia that is like the, the cheap stuff comes, um, it, it's most of the time it's more expensive than the original thing. So when you have to, when you pay something, um, that we, most of our clients know that. And even if they find it to be maybe cheaper, but it sounds well, well, that's actually great. And if you raise your rates, they're going to be able, they're going to be willing to pay for that because that's what you're worth. And that's the, the work that you're doing and it's totally fine. Um, so the next question that we have, this is from Sean. I believe he's not here, but well, the recording is gonna be there and I think that, um, are you like the other participants here are going to benefit from this? This is more a question for me. So um, yeah, this is this is a question for the Voice Benny staff. Um, when we request a revision compensation as part of a revision, is that amount paid out by the client or thus does Voice Benny cover it themselves as part of a service guarantee? So 90% of the time we pay for it. Um, we have inside our budget from the from all the payments and from, from, from the charges that we have for our clients, we um, are the ones that cover those revision fees. Most of the time, I would say 90, 95% of the time, we are the ones to cover them. We have a specific budget for these revisions because we do not expect those revision fees to be 100% common as most of the time our clients um, do not request um, th that many revisions. However, there are 
exceptions. For example, the client is requesting a new section for the script. For example, the client is requesting you to add words or the client is saying change completely the intention of the voiceover. In those cases, we do request the client to pay a small percentage. It's not as if um, they are requested to pay the full price again, but we do request them to pay a small fee for those changes. However, um, that's not that common either. Um, so most of the time when you request an extra revision uh, request um, fee, we are the ones who are paying them and we are the ones who are covering those. Okay, I have a question then. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I've had that experience. Yeah. Where it's considered a revision but the client says, okay, we want to add uh, another paragraph to the read, or we've decided to change um, the read altogether. Should we reach out to Voice Money and, and tell them that, listen, this isn't a re revision that has anything to do with my read. They've just changed mm -hmm. the script. That's something that the client should be paying for, right? Not Voice Money. Yes, exactly. So most of the time, the client will be paying for that. However, it's important that if you see that the project was completely changed in a revision request, you let us know. Sometimes the clients are not even um, paying for those changes, sometimes out of not knowing. So yeah. it's important if you let us know if you see that it's a huge change. If you see that it's just, I don't know, they changed one sentence, most of the time they are paying for that and we are paying for that as well. Like what I was saying, the clients are paying for some part of that, but they're sometimes they're not paying for the full read again or for the whole word count. We are the ones that are paying that difference and we're the ones who are covering that. So if you see that the project is just making a huge change, yeah. What's the revision fee? And let us know so that we can go ahead and make sure that the client is paying for that change. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've had that a couple of times and yeah. I wasn't quite sure how to handle it. So if, if there is a, a major script change and it's con they want to consider it a revision, reach out to Voice Bunny, let them know what's going on. That's yes, the one great exactly. thing about Voice Bunny is they're, uh, they're so openly communicative. Um, they they want to know. Uh, what's going on. They want to know how well they're doing. Um, they want to know if, if they're being helpful. So uh, don't be shy. The, the last thing you want to do is be shy with Voice Bunny because they'll, uh, they'll answer right away. Totally. And we're always open. Um, the worst that can happen is that maybe we can say no, but we are going to be willing to look into that and take the time to make sure that everything is okay and that we can do everything that's in our power to help. Um, so next question from Jay Carlo, and we have one more question after that, um, and we have to close. So is there always going to be a bit of noise, even if it's minimal, or is there a way you record 100% clean straight from the mic, like if a noise gate was used, or do you eventually have to do a small amount of processing or even gate before the preamp? So um, I believe that Juan Santiago and I can answer the question, as we are both professional engine, audio engineers. So um it's completely if someone tells you that you can get out 100 percent noise-free recording right off the bat they're lying mm -hmm. there's no way an equipment is going to be 100 percent noise-free trust me um every single piece of equipment from the microphone to the cable to the preamplifier to the interface to your computer to the DAW everything is going to add a small amount of noise there is never going to be a 100% noise free recording and if you have there might be a problem with your recording chain because what happens this are most of the time these are digital um equipment digital equipment is going to i mean 100% add some noise and that's perfectly fine the problem is when the noise is so noticeable that is distracting from your recording or that it is very present so for example if you have um, a lot of hiss and you can listen to it right on top of your voice or right below your voice like a hum that's there's when when there's a real problem with the recording um if you want to if you want to use a noise gate I would advise you to be very careful with it. Noise gates can be very tricky because if they're not set properly and the gate is not, um, doesn't have a knee or doesn't have like a closed gate that is appropriately 
um, set, it can totally damage the recording and you can totally notice the difference between the recording and the, and, um, the no noise um, situation that is you just cut the audio and you don't fade it properly. I personally never use a gate. I always cut my um, recordings by hand. So it's much easier and much better if you just go and listen to the recording and cut them um, manually and fade them manually, either with crossfades if you want to put one take uh, on top of the other, or just use a fade out and a fade in with, between the recordings. Gates can be very complicated to use. Also because some gates, I'm not saying all of them, but some gates also have a compressor to make sure that the noises and that the differences between one take and the other are not that different. So I would not recommend you to use those for this voice bunny recordings as we need them to be very clean and very easy to use and very um clear right out the start so yeah basically to summarize that you will never get a hundred percent noise-free recording even if you're recording in um the most silent studio ever there's always going to be some noise even the the wind makes noises your mouths make noises you breathe their your skin i mean everything is going to make some noise even if it's not your preamplifier you can have a universal audio you can have uh, um meet us um console it's always going to have some certain very low level of noise. Just mm -hmm. make sure that this noise is not present, that it's not noticeable, and that you have a good um, noise floor happening there. Yep, for sure. Agreed. Great. And, and the last question from Agustin Hiraudo is, Dear Tommy, how are you getting ready for casting if you get ready for castings? How do I get ready for a casting? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure uh, how that means. By the way, uh, Augustine, thank you for he, he's already connected with me on LinkedIn. I've, I've been <laughs> oh great <laughs> connections from from folks. Thank you very much for that. Um, how am I get ready for getting ready for a casting? I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, I believe that what he means is how do you get if you participate in contests, but well, that we know that that you don't if. How do you get ready to participate in those? Or if you do it outside, if you participate in like in casting calls for other type of projects outside of Base Benny, maybe. Oh, things I might audition That's for. It. Yeah. I might audition for. Um, I do everything that we just talked about um, earlier. You know, I, I go through the process of analyzing the script, connecting to the script, identifying what my role is, who I'm talking to, what the message is all of those things um, it takes discipline and i take that extra you know 5 10 15 minutes to figure out um, you know what is it that the client's looking for how am i going to make my performance better and more interesting than any others it's so competitive there are so many people out there with way better voices than i have um, that, that have just been given this the god-given gift of a beautiful voice, um, you know, and, and, and I need to do whatever I can to compensate for, you know, what I don't have. And, and that is by, by studying and by preparation, by training, by getting coaching. Um, coaches have coaches who have coaches who have coaches and, and you know, it's very cyclical. Um, I totally recommend, and that's the one thing that, that you don't hear a whole lot about. Um, many Many platforms, including Voice Bunny, will tell you, you know, you need to get ready for uh, being a professional talent by getting the best, you know, equipment that you can afford, uh, you know, by making sure that your acoustics are right, uh, by doing this and by doing that. And I think that there is an under uh, appreciation for uh, getting professional training and delivery. Um, and, and those are the things that are going to make you better uh, by, ex by exploring uh, your vocal potential, your potential, by, by trying to um, increase the, uh, I guess, the, the arsenal that you have uh, in, in your vocal inventory of the things that you can deliver um, by practicing. Um, you know, even if you don't go by coaching, 
record yourself and listen, record and listen, record and listen, and, and push yourself and, and, and explore those vocal ranges to see what works and what doesn't. Uh, that's the only way you're going to get better. And you should always be working in somewhat of a discomfort zone too. Otherwise, you're not learning. If, if you're constantly comfortable and, and just sort of working in, in a comfort zone, um, you're not getting any better. You're just, you're just kind of languishing in, in the moment. Um, you should always be, be working to, to get better. And you know, whether you've just been doing this for three months or in my case, you know, close to 40 years, you should always be pushing to get better and better and better because there's no finish line. There's never a finish line. There's always a way to get better and better and better. Totally. And there's always this thing that um, commercials and everything, it gets more modern every time. Things are going to change. The voice that you were used to listening in the 90s is not the same that you will listen to right now. So the voiceovers that we were used to listen to before are not the same voices, are not the same um, requirements that are today. So it's also, it's like, I don't know, I always compare this to pilots from airplanes. Mm -hmm. Airplanes change all the time. You're not going to have the exact same te technology from time to time. And um, if you see pilots have to renew their licenses every, like, I don't know, three to four years, depending on how often their airlines change the airplanes. So that's also something that you have to keep in mind. You will never um, be in the same position and there's always things that are going to be changing. So I believe it's a matter of always listening and always trying to get better and always trying to move forward with that. So um, I believe that we're done. We went a little bit over the a lot of time that we had, but okay. this was just amazing. This webinar personally was my very favorite of all of the webinars that we have oh, hosted. you're just saying that no you're i'm serious that. i'm serious it was really amazing um listening to the voice of the experience is just great i hope that everyone that joined here and that is still here um um learned as much as i did because i personally did and just thank you very much tommy thank you very very much for working with us for all this time for um showing all of this to us for teaching and showing that 40 year experience with us it's just amazing um everything that you have to teach and everything that you have to say and if you guys over there um I would personally recommend Tommy for coaching. If you're interested in getting a coach, if you're interested in getting better, learning more from this person that has all the experience in the world, I would totally recommend them. Um, his website is in our Facebook page or um, in the invitation that you got for this webinar. It's also going to be as well. And in the webinar recap, you're going to find the recording to this video alongside um, the slides and everything that was associated with it. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Tommy, for being our partner in crime and teaching <laughs> and, and telling all of this with us. Thank you so much, uh, Angela and Juan. I really appreciate it. Hope to do it again sometime. And uh, and whatever I can do to contribute and and thank you all uh, who continue to hang even through the uh, the goodbyes here um, if you'd like to contact me my website is tommygriffiths.com and and uh, you know if, if you just have questions you know feel free to email me I'm, I'm here to help so thanks again this was uh, truly enjoyable I really appreciate it yeah, it was very enjoyable for us too. Also, guys, remember that we also have a community space. Um, Tommy is also there. So if you want to ask questions, if you want to submit demos for him to give you some feedback as well, or even Juan Santiago or me or other voice actors, you can go ahead and upload them all in our community space. You can find that at help.bunnyinc.com. That's our Help Center website. You're going to find the community button there, and you're going to be able to find a lot of tips and advice. You can upload your demos. It's um, a place for all of us, um, Voice Benny, Benny Pros, and Voice Benny staff members to join. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of your afternoon 
or morning if you're just starting your day night day whatever i don't know what time it is in your time zone but whatever time it is i hope you enjoy the rest of your time if you're woken up and if you're just starting your day just have an amazing beautiful day goodbye see you next time goodbye. thank never you Tommy, and thank you everyone keep working never give up never give up just keep doing it and everything is gonna be okay thank you very much guys bye bye